In this video, we're going to kick off our discussion of virtue from Chapter 8 of Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, with the virtue of independence. Stay tuned. So let's start with the chapter summary. And this is kind of introducing us to how Leonard is approaching the topic of virtue. And what we get is that we're going to be examining the derivative virtues, which are all aspects of the virtue of rationality. And he stresses that virtue from objectivism's perspective is not kind of isolated character traits or something like that. What they are, they are an integrated way of life that we're kind of specifying aspects of. And so what distinguishes those aspects in other words, what allows us to carve out some things? Well, this is a specific aspect of rationality that we want to highlight. Well, if you think about more broadly what we're trying to do with ethics and with virtue is we're trying to establish a certain relationship between existence and consciousness. And in particular, it's how do we conform to existence? How do we recognize in thought and action the primacy of existence? And so what each virtue is going to do is it's taking the goal of life and it's combining it with a certain metaphysically given fact. We've been talking throughout this book about how all norms for objectivism are a combination of a goal and a, and a metaphysically given fact. And so it's going to distinguish the individual virtues, the derivative virtues, is the metaphysically given fact that they're recognizing that we're going to conform to and by that manner be able to conform to the primacy of existence. And then the final point Leonard makes here is that this is not the totality of moral knowledge that one could have, but rather the minimal amount of knowledge, moral knowledge, that one needs in order to achieve life, in order to achieve self-preservation. So let's say just a little bit more about what we're going to be doing as we look at the virtues. So if you remember our discussion of rationality, we said, what are virtues? Well, they're causal principles. Now, they're not causal principles like in physics. It's not as if practice the virtue, you get guaranteed uh, cash value results right away. Rather, it's that they're necessary conditions of success. It's that to successfully achieve values, you have to conduct your life in this manner. And we did say, though, that it's over time, barring accidents, the virtues are that which will lead to values. Now, one of the really fascinating lectures that Leonard has given is he has a course called Moral Virtue. And in a lecture on independence, which obviously is the topic we'll be covering today, he talks about the way in which his original presentation of virtues was all wrong. And that what he was seeing was that it was too conventional. It wasn't making use of deeper ideas in the philosophy and often wasn't making use of the major places in which Ayn Rand covers these issues, the novels. And so he's talking about independence and he realizes, well, I haven't really been thinking about The Fountainhead, which in essence you can think of as a novel about independence. It's not only about independence, but that's kind of at front and center of the novel. And so you, it, it's really worth listening to this lecture to see how he went about recognizing that he made this error. But one of the things that you get from it then is a, an appreciation of the structure of how he's presenting the virtues here. And he uses what he calls the pie structure. And that is the principle, the internal and the external aspects of it. So that often Ayn Rand will define a virtue in, in terms of its uh, internal intellectual side, and then its existential or external side, the kind of action that it demands. And what we get in the principle, which is the bold uh, section titles, is what unifies these. And so we want to, as we go through, one of the things we're really going to try to highlight is, all right, what's the principle? What's the intellectual demands? What are the existential demands? And then what's the metaphysically given fact that's being recognized by this virtue? And so with that, I think we're ready to dive in with the first virtue we're going to cover, independence. Let's look at what Leonard covers with independence. So the section title here is Independence as a Primary Orientation to Reality, Not to Other Men. And so we start out with Ayn Rand's definition of independence, which is we've talked about is going to highlight both 
the intellectual and the existential side of the virtue. And so she puts it as independence is one's acceptance of the responsibility of forming one's own judgments and of living by the work of one's own mind. And so then we get a discussion of what is this principle? And it's that it recognizes the metaphysically given fact that reason is an attribute of the individual. That to say that thinking is our means of survival, we have to take seriously like, who's going to do the thinking. Well, only you can do the thinking. Only you as an individual can grasp what's true, can evaluate and reach values, that it's a fact of human nature that we can't share our thinking with one another. We can share the outcome of our thinking, but the actual process of connecting our mind to reality is something that each of us has to perform alone. And the opposite policy, the person who doesn't do this, is the person who is oriented not towards reality, but to other people to quote what they believe what they feel what they can wheedle out of or pump into them what he can do to with and for them and it the way leonard describes it it's to be a parasite on your own species we get then an integration of independence with fundamental issues in objectivism we get the way in which it's the primacy of existence is that we're conforming to reality not to consciousness not to our not it's not to god's consciousness but in this particular virtue what we're highlighting is not to the consciousness of other men it's uh an, another aspect that leonard brings in is it's the metaphysically given versus the man-made if you recall it's we discussed the way in which one cannot accept the man-made uncritically one has to evaluate it does it conform to the metaphysically given? And independence is about, I'm not going to conform to the man-made. I'm not going to accept it uncritically. I'm going to be focused on primarily what is the metaphysically given and conform to that. We get an integration with reason as man's basic means of survival and say that this is that the independent person is the person who takes the responsibility of thinking, of forming his own judgments as against the person who settles for drift and who turns away from reality through evasion. And we get an integration with egoism, that the true egoist is the, is the independent person in that a person who lives through others, even if they are intending to seek their own interests, and we'll talk more about that, but you can think about a social climber like um, Peter Keating, it's that they're selfless in the literal sense. It's that they have no ideas and values of their own, it's that they surrender all of that to others. And so that gives us the principle. It's that basic re orientation, that primary orientation to reality, not to other men, is what the principle of independence counsels. And then so intellectually, what does that demand? Well, you can put it as think for yourself versus take the ideas of others on faith. So it's, it's, you need to form your own ideas. You need to form your own uh, judgments. And it's that if you accept the ideas of others on faith, even if they're true, from your perspective, they're arbitrary. And we remember we had the whole discussion about the way in which arbitrary wrecks your mental functioning. And this doesn't mean, of course, you can't learn from others. It's you don't accept it uncritically that you actually have to go through the process of learning, which means going through the process such that the conclusion is connected in your mind to reality. It's not something that you're just parroting. So then we get to the existential demands. And this is, Leonard stresses, thought is for the sake of action, that to be rational means to guide our lives by reason. It doesn't mean to sit in a cave and you know very rationally try to understand um, you know, the texture of the cave or something. It's that you're trying to guide your life through reason and that what independence uh, counsels fundamentally is that to live by reason means to live by the work of your own mind. And we'll get that spelled out much more when we talk about productiveness. But it's this doesn't mean working alone on a desert island. It means, yeah, you can engage in the division of labor. Again, it's a primary orientation to reality, not to other men. So, you know, a person like Rourke has clients and even says he needs clients in order to build. And he works with builders like Mike, but that he's focused on what is the best way to build. He's not following the judgments of others. He's not serving the judgments of others. He's not sacrificing his standards to others. He's focused on reality. Whereas the opposite policy, 
well, you can mooch it to use the language of Atlas Shrugged. You can loot. You can try to extract values from others through manipulation or through force. Um, but you can also just passively imitate. And that's what you can think of as a Peter Keating, where you're not actually creating values. You're kind of echoing the um, methods that other people have formed, whereas every human being on any level of ability can be a first hander in their work. They can ask, what am I trying to achieve and what's the best way to achieve it? They can formulate their own standards, come up with what you can think of as like micro innovations about like, hey, this office could be organized in a better way or something like that. Um, but that it is that to the great creators, to the top creators, who are the ones who more than anybody push human life forward. They're the ones who discover logic, who discover physics and the scientific method, um, who create new kinds and forms of music and things. And so it's that what they are is you can think about the first hand or the creator par excellence, and that it's all of us can kind of take inspiration from that and do that in whatever scale is open to our ability, but that all that what they clearly present when you look at the first-handed creators is why human life depends on first-handedness that it makes starkly clear because if it weren't for them being first-handed if it weren't for them being independent then human beings would barely be able to eke out a survival right it's that we take the modern world for granted but it's the product of those who were independent and so it's all of us should and can on our own scale live in that sort of independent manner all right so let's start by identifying mpi if you want to put it that way so it's the principle is a primary orientation to reality not to other men and i'm highlighting the word primary here we'll expand on that but it's that the from the objectivist perspective this idea that like being independent means not benefiting from others not learning from them not engaging in social relationships all that is off the table, e even in grasping the principle. Grasping the principle is what are you primarily oriented towards, not what is the only thing that you look at or care about. And you can remember the parallel to egoism here. Remember, egoism, selfishness is the idea that your primary concern is your interest, but it doesn't mean you're not concerned with the interests of others. And indeed, for those who are most profoundly important to your life, their interests become subsumed in a way in, in your interests. And so it's a primary uh, orientation to reality, not to other men. The metaphysically given fact that it's recognizing is that reason is an attribute of the individual. It's, and if you recall our discussion of that uh, idea, it was a certain perspective on free will. It's that you are a being of volitional consciousness. In order to keep your consciousness connected to reality, you have to do the thinking, that there can't be a substitute for that. And so what what independence is drawing out is that other people can't be a substitute because like you, they're beings with free will who can depart from reality. So you have to be oriented to reality and you have to judge them. You have to judge the whole realm of the man-made critically, not accept it uncritically. And then so the um, intellectual side of it is acceptance of the responsibility for forming your own judgments, which means both what is true and what is good what its cognitive conclusions and then its evaluations and just as an aside one of the things that Ayn Rand often talks about so if you read something like um in voices uh, voice of reason she has uh, some early essays on um to science to young scientists uh she has a piece on who's the final authority on ethics she has a piece right after that on altruism as appeasement and often in these in, in these three pieces and throughout her she stresses the way in which the major area in which people go wrong is in the area of values it's that they'll exercise a certain amount of independence and maybe even a lot of independence in the realm of what's true but in terms of setting goals and establishing goals that that is usually the area where they in effect default to others so then existentially it's living by the work of your own mind which as we talked about the both parts of that are important it's that you're living by work it's that you're not mooching you're not looting but it's by the work of your own mind so it's not the peter keating who makes himself miserable and doesn't get any pleasure from his work because he's basically just trying to echo what he thinks people want to see in architecture where he has no standards of his own no view of 
yeah, I value this endeavor. I'm trying to achieve something in this endeavor. It's I'm going to get to the top of something I don't care about by following standards that aren't mine. And so that's kind of the, the overview that's the of what the core takeaway is in this uh, section. Um, it's the, the major thing to take away, I think, is that it's you're not defaulting on the responsibility of saying, what are the facts? And treating other people and their judgments as a substitute. And it's, I'm setting the goals based on what's true, based on the facts, versus I'm just going to take over the goals set by others, and I have no clue where those goals are going to lead. So the next topic that I want to turn to then is I've been saying that one of the insights Leonard gets is that if you have if he reached the view that a virtue basically amount an objectivist virtue amounted to common sense like that should be a red flag that objectivism is supposed to be a radical philosophy calling people to live a very unconventional kind of life and so if we end up with very conventional guidance we've probably gone wrong from somewhere and so if independence stands in your mind is essentially like go to work and don't be a beggar and that you don't have a distinction between a Peter Keating who certainly goes to work and becomes one of the most successful people in the country. Um, if, if, if it's, well, I guess he's a paragon of independence, you know you've gone terribly wrong. And I find that it's helpful for this particular virtue to get how radically unique objectivism's advice is, is to see her kind of critique of the negative, which I just indicated with that Peter Keating example. Um, and, the, and her analysis of what she calls the second hander or in her nonfiction often will be put as social metaphysics. And one really valuable source here is Nathaniel Brandon wrote a series of things on so, this idea of social metaphysics uh, in the objectivist, and I think the objectivist newsletter as well, that really bring out aspects of this issue of independence versus dependence that are in the novels, but that uh, this is kind of the the richest, most explicit treatment in the nonfiction. So it's definitely worth um, reading those. And they're reprinted. I haven't looked to see if there's any notable changes between what's in the journal articles and then his book, Psychology of Self-Esteem, but the latter is definitely easier to find. So the core issue with being a second hander is it's not that a Peter Keating or an Ellsworth too, he says, you know what, here's the facts, here's what other people say. Ah, forget the facts, I'm, I'm going with what other people say. It's that they lose a firm distinction between it is and they say, or you could put it as they don't distinguish between the metaphysically given and the man-made. It's that all of that gets blurred and they basically are the world is a series of yeah there's a blurred uh how would you put it indistinguishable mix of well yeah there's 365 days in a year and you know my mother wants me to be a doctor like all of that is on the same level like it's good to sacrifice um, we shouldn't go to extremes in politics. Like all of that is on the same level. There's no distinction between, wait, is that a man-made fact or man-made claim that should be evaluated? No, it's just that's what they say. So it all gets blurred. And then part of what independence is highlighting then is, no, you can't do that. You can't treat the opinions, beliefs, judgments of others as the unquestioned to be conformed to in the way that you do with the metaphysically given it's that you have to distinguish those and the second hander does not do that he's conforming to something that may be aligned with reality or may not and even if it is aligned with reality for him it's arbitrary as we've talked about so he's cut off he's cut his mind off from reality then related to this is that he bases his self-esteem he uh, the way in which he judges himself on how other people respond to him so if we think about um the we'll talk about this more when we get to pride but it's when we get to pride the perspective on self-esteem is i'm good because i'm rational i'm able to cope with the challenges of life because i use my mind to understand the world and navigate my way through it 
But for the second hander, it's I'm good because of my relationship with other people. So for some second handers, it's I'm good because people like me. For others, it's because I reject other people is why I'm good, or other people are inferior to me, or I have power, I have control over other people. Other people fear and obey me, but it's all your self-esteem or what's actually a pretense of self-esteem, what objectivism calls pseudo self-esteem is based in other people. And the more accurate way to think about it is not even I'm good because I'm other people like me. Rather, it's I don't feel good. I don't feel worthy. And well, other people seem to like me, though. Maybe I am worthy or other people seem to fear me. Maybe I am worthy. So it's that's the way in which it's a pretense. It's that a person does not feel secure in his relationship to reality, that I'm able to cope with the challenges and worthy of happiness. And so they're trying to substitute for it through other people. But notice how precarious that is. What happens when I meet somebody who doesn't accept or like me? And Brandon gives a really eloquent and like soul-crushing example of a, a businessman, a CEO he knew, who was just completely obsessed with like, I think like a stock boy or mail boy or something, the guy, the kid's opinion of him. And it's because for him, that kid stood for humanity and he had to win over this kid's approval in order to feel okay in the universe, even though like, you know, there, there was no practical benefit he could get from this kid. It was just purely, this was a symbol of humanity's judgment of him, which was, that's what his self-esteem is based on. Um, you know, for a power luster, what happens when you run into somebody who doesn't fear you or doesn't obey you? Or when you run into somebody who is just knocking you over the head with the fact that they're not inferior to you? And we've talked about that a lot when we talked about the nature of evil, the way in which evil is a sense of, I feel inferior. My self-esteem is going to be based on not feeling inferior and my pretense at self-esteem. And so I need to have power over people. And in particular, what I want to do is smash the people who are confronting me or making me feel inferior. And so we get in the fountainhead, if you'll recall, very early on, it's the idea of like, many people felt uncomfortable in Rourke's presence. And part of it is this idea of they make he makes them very aware of their default on independent judgment, on their default on self-esteem. And so you can get a real resentment, which is if you think Tui's obsessive desire to destroy Rourke is all about that Rourke is a complete affront to him and makes him just super aware of his feelings of inferiority. And that's why he wants to crush him. And we get an even more explicit take on that in Atlas Shrugged through the character primarily of uh, Jim Taggart. And again, we talked about all of that when we discussed evil. But I think a lot of what can be baffling about human behavior makes sense when you see it as it's a second-hander coping with threats to their pseudo self-esteem, to their pretense of self-esteem. So in Brandon's writing on the idea of social metaphysics, he identifies what you can think of as four uh, of the roots that can lead people to become second-handers. And so the first, he says, is that thinking requires effort. It's work. And we talked about how that the, there can be this anti-effort mentality that doesn't want to do the work of thinking, that doesn't want to exert that kind of effort. And so they want to exist in a state of drift, and then they use evasion in order to maintain that state of drift. We get from the second point he mentions is a policy of thinking practiced consistently as a way of life forbids one the possibility of indulging desires or emotions that clash with one's understanding and convictions. And again, when we talked about the nature of evil, we talked about uh, how the whole nature of evasion is the desire to put the I wish over the it is. Then three, we get man's mind is fallible. He can make an error at any step of the thinking process. And if he acts on his air, he may suffer pain or defeat or destruction. And Brandon says, this is really the core issue. This is the central issue that kind of lead people to uh, embrace or fall for the other three elements, one of which I haven't talked about yet. But it's this, I might be wrong. Like, how do I know it's right? Well, other people seem to know it's right. 
they seem to know how to live. So it's safer to just follow them. It's safer than relying on my own judgment because they seem to know and I might be wrong. And then we get four, his independent thinking may bring a person into conflict with the opinions and judgments of others, thus provoking disapproval or animosity. And so, I mean, in effect, you can think of these are the four things not to fall for. Like you need to embrace the effort to live by your mind. You need to choose to think. That's kind of the foundation. You need to um, place reason over emotion. That is, reason is your means of contact with reality and never try to get away with an I wish over the it is. It's I wish it because it is, is the attitude that you want to cultivate. It's that, yeah, your thinking can go wrong, but there's no possible substitute. The reason is a faculty of the individual and that other people who, quote, seem to know how to live, you don't know that unless you examine their ideas and their values, their goals critically. And so you have to exercise that thought. You cannot. You can learn from them then. You can say, hmm, like this guy really seems to know something about reality. Let me try to understand it myself. But it's that you have to go through the process that you cannot delegate the responsibility of thinking that that does not make the possibility of failure disappear. It just makes it way, uh, it guarantees that you won't succeed because you're now out of control. You've surrendered control over your mind and therefore your life to other people. And then four, it's, you don't court conflict with others, but that you have to accept it as the price for being in contact with reality. That that the attempt to avoid conflict with others means the attempt to place others above reality. So Brandon goes on to, de to describe different types of uh, social metaphysics and these are really just all things that are in Ayn Rand's novels. And so I just, but I wanted to go through a couple that are in the fountainhead that I think really clarify and affect, right? This is what it means to be a dependent. And this is not what I want to be. This is not what I want to be. This is what the virtue of independence is saying, like, don't go in that direction, go in the direction of O'Rourke. So, I mean, the most obvious case is the Peter Keating, which you can think of as the conformist. It's a person who says, looks around and says, I'm going to become what other people want me to become. And that's how I'm going to get their approval. That's how I'm going to rise to the top of society. That's how I'm going to function is whatever they, you know, say, that's what I believe. Whatever they want, that's what I'm going to do. Then you have the nonconformist, which you can think of the Gus Webb type, who's the, you know, avant-garde architect or the Lois Cook avant-garde writer. It's that they look around and say, um, well, I don't think I can become what other people want me to become. That seems really hard work. I'm not going to be able to out Peter Keating and Peter Keating. So what it, I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the opposite. This is the idea that Brandon talks about in The Virtue of Selfishness is counterfeit individualism. And what it really amounts to is the idea of they that I'm going to reject them and tell my story that I'm superior because I rejected them. So it's they want the approval that they're really oriented towards others, but in effect, because they feel like deeply incapable of achieving that approval, of getting that approval, they're kind of trying to get a hold of power, uh, maintain their sense of control over their lives by preemptively rejecting people's approval. So they can say, it's not that you denied it to me, it's that I didn't want it. And uh, comedians will often talk about this is really interesting in their kind of development and their sense of humor, often it's they're young, there's kind of social outcasts and they realize, oh, I'm going to make fun of the things that I'm ashamed of or that I feel inferior about um, rather than let other people do it because now I have control over it. It takes some of the sting out of it. And you can think about the nonconformist as a person who's elevated that into a way of life. Then we get the power luster, which we see through Tuhi and then in a different sort of way, Wynan. And just like the the um, nonconformists, they feel like, in effect, man, Peter Keating has it made. Like he's he's the dude, but I can't compete with that. That's way too precarious to gain everybody's approval. And so what it is is instead of trying to win it, I'm going to command it. I'm going to resort to manipulation, dishonesty, or outright coercion to get what I want from people. And that seems kind of like a more secure grip 
to have power over them rather than try to win them over voluntarily, if you want to put it that way. Now, that said, Winan is a different case because whereas Tuhi is somebody who has zero self-esteem is trying to fill it through power, what we get with Winan is this is somebody who had a massive foundation of self-esteem, of his own self-efficacy, but makes a crucial error. And we see through his development like why he's led to make this error, which is he thinks, no, the only choice you have in life is to dominate or be dominated by others. And I don't want to be a sucker, so I'm going to seek to dominate them. And he has a story he's telling himself that, well, one day, once I collect this power, then I'm going to use it for my values, for the things that I care about. But what we get is the way in which he's completely de wiping his self out of existence, surrendering to the crowd, and ultimately becomes a puppet of the crowd that he thinks he has this power and control that he can use for his own ends but he gives up having own end, his own ends and um you know by telling the public what it wants to hear he's really the one who's the puppet he's at the command of the crowd and the kind of quintessential idea that we get with Winan is this line from the fountainhead that a leash is just a rope with a noose at both ends and that there's not real power here in the way that he thinks that there is. So one last type that Brandon mentions that's not in the fountainhead, uh, or at least it's not leaping out to me that it is, but I thought it's just very fascinating, is um, the religious fanatic. And here it's you, you also have this kind of idea of like, well, in effect, Peter Keating is the real kind of paragon of achievement. He's able to win everybody's approval. And somebody who feels incapable of doing that well man i can just you know uh win over god's approval and imagine him smiling down at me and feeling superior to everybody no matter how much they kind of uh turn their nose up at my way of life um i have this imaginary thing that can give me the approval that i seek and all i have to do is live up to what i imagine its orders to be so um what we can say then is having gone through this has been focused on the negative right um let's take it back now to the kind of conventional view of selfishness and selfless and how ayn rand's unique view of independence leads to a radically different conception of selfishness and of selflessness so conventionally we would have Peter Keating and Gail Wine and held up as this is what it means to be selfish. We have somebody after power and we have a social climber who's trying to manipulate people and to get to the top of his profession. And Rand's view is that they they totally give up on it. They never have a self. They never form a self. It's yeah, they believe what others believe. They'll value whatever others value. And so in this sense they're deeply selfless. They're letting others dictate their ideas and especially their values. And so this is where Leonard says, whatever his goal or intended beneficiary, such a man is a literal altruist. He places others above self in the deepest sense and he pays the price. So you can put it another way. Um, they aren't pursuing their interests at all because they don't even have a self-interest. They don't have a self, they don't have interest. And so... It can be that their motive, if you were really trying to get how it stands in their minds, like, yeah, they're not out to serve the needs of others like a Mother Teresa, but it's that um, that does not matter because as a factual matter, what they're doing is placing others above self, is, is, is becoming puppets for others. And so that is, if you think about um, how most people think about selflessness, you get just a completely different view of what selflessness actually consists of. Now, in the Fountainhead, we do get a version of selflessness that is much more of the Mother Teresa type, and that's Catherine Halsey. And, uh, you know, this is a kind of view of selfless, selflessness where somebody's really committed in a certain way of, yeah, I want to put others above myself. I don't want to be, uh, I'm not uh, trying to be a social climber. But we get that it's the same thing. It's the same sort of inner emptiness, resentment and anger at other people because they forced us to stifle down who who we are, the self that we never developed. But that 
from Ayn Rand's perspective, whether one is using altruism as an ideology, as a cover for the kind of social climbing or power seeking, or whether one's really trying to implement it like a Catherine Halsey, it all amounts to the same thing, which is the complete crippling and lack of a self, lack of your own independent standards and ideas that you're trying to bring into reality in the way that Rourke does. And so if you think about an independent person, it's a thinker. It's somebody who's forming their own conclusions about what's true and what's good. And I mean, think about the way that a teenager who's not yet at the level of thinking about things fully philosophically, but who's forming an independent self is functioning. Like they're thinking about things like, do I agree with my parents about religion or about politics? Um, do, they're looking around at their peers. Do I really care about the things they care about? Do I admire what they admire? Do I approve of how they're living? And you know, what do I find sexually attractive? What do I look for in a friend? Um, what kind of activities do I find engaging? And building out of that, what kind of career do I want? And what should I be seeking out of a career? What really is good for me? What really is true? And so what you and so notice uh, that there really is this we've talked about in the process of valuing um, the way in which a person who's engaging their mind, it's that they're really engaged in a process of thinking about their self-interest. And we see the kind of natural way that a young person who's thinking and asking questions is doing that. They're not yet at the level of asking, should I be an altruist or an egoist? Um, but they're, the real focus is on my life, my values, my goals. And what they're building um, is they're building a view of the world, a view of what's true and what's good. And along with that, then there's kind of two related things that are emerging. One is a sense of responsibility because what they're getting is I am in control of my own mind. I'm in control of my life and therefore I'm responsible for my mind in my life. It's by taking responsibility that they come to experience themselves as having responsibility, is that um, the more that they're exercising their own thought, their own judgment, and the more and more they're taking control over their own life, the more that you get the sense of, I am an agent. I am responsible and I'm capable of taking on those responsibilities. And then related to that is that they're forming a sense of self and a strong sense of self because it's I'm responsible for my life and building an integrated set of values that con will constitute my life that this is what I think is right this is what I think is true this is what I stand for this is what's personally meaningful to me and so that it's by a commitment to thinking that we develop a sense of self a sense of responsibility and that you grow into a, the direction of a Rourke rather than one of these versions of second-handedness. Usually discussions of virtue see virtues as character traits, and Ayn Rand formulates them more specifically in terms of actions. And I think the reason she's doing this is she's saying like, this is the course of action you should follow. This is what you should do. And it's only indirectly then that we form a character. But she definitely is the view that one forms a character and that uh, as we talked about when we got when we started the whole discussion of the good, that your goal ultimately is to form a character that you admire, the character formed in the image of your ideal. But precisely in that that one forms a character by acting on a premise. And so if we think about the virtues as this is the premise you should act on, precisely because we form a character by acting on a premise over time and automatizing it, that by the time we get to studying philosophy explicitly, we have automatized all sorts of character traits, including ones that we might not like that much. And so it's definitely possible for a good person to come to objectivism and say, man, I have elements of secondhandedism in my character of dependence or of, you know, some of the... Uh, other virtues, the kind of defaults on them. And so I think it's helpful to think a little bit about, well, what can we do to cultivate the virtues? And so this is something that I want to do a lot more thinking about 
uh, as time goes by, but I want to share at least some initial thoughts on this idea of how to cultivate the virtue of independence. And, um, you know, again, not the last word, but my first word. And so a few thoughts on that. So the first thing I say is that it doesn't do you any good to just sit there and go, all right, I'm going to try not to care what other people think. Like that's not the right approach. I would say if you look at the kind of advice that's given here, it's work really hard to distinguish between the metaphysically given and the man-made between the it is and the they say or they feel or they want or they've decided or they've judged and we've we've seen various forms in which this comes up so yes there's the like my mother tells me to become a doctor type example or you have a duty to sacrifice but remember the man-made is a much wider set of um, products activities it's even concepts, right? Concepts are all the man made. And we talked about the way in which objectivism teaches you to question them and say that just because somebody has a concept like uh, isolationism or extremism, I have to, I can't uncritically accept concepts. I need to really question those. But it's that you should really get, you, you really want to take seriously of, all right, is this man made or is this a metaphysically given? metaphysically given okay then i'm going to accept it uncritically as an absolute and if it's man-made then i'm going to examine it critically by does it conform to the man-made and so the broadest terms the mindset is not don't think about what other people think it's try to see the truth clearly and this includes evaluating things objectively having what are my standards and then how do i evaluate this thing given my standards and I think this gets then to actually the hardest part is uh, of um, becoming more independent if it's not something you've cultivated throughout your life is establishing your own personal values. Because if you recall the fountainhead, at the end, spoiler alert, Keating realizes that his whole way of life has been a disaster. And he tries to go back to an early love that he had, which was art, which is what he gave up to become an architect, because that's what his mother wanted. And he goes out to a cabin and he engages in painting and he brings them to Rourke. And Rourke tells him essentially it's too late. And again, it's not too late in terms of developing the skill set. Like I think Peter Keating is in his early 40s, something like that at this point. It's that he has not developed his own personal values in that he squelched them so much over the course of decades that to develop personal values that then would be expressed in art um, would, you know, at least in the context of the Fountainhead, we're told like that there's just not enough time in his life to do that. So it's uh, presumably if you're interested in objectivism, you haven't gone that far, um, but it can be hard to kind of nurture that voice of what do I want? And so I think it's one... Um, one useful question is often what would I do or what would I like or what would I choose if I didn't care about what others thought I think proactively establishing your favorites in every sphere of your life including small things so like Ayn Rand had a favorite color and filled her life with this blue green and shows up even in Atlas Shrugged as the color of reared in steel of reared in metal um, but then how do you establish your favorites? Well, it's, I mean, it's essentially starts with just asking yourself, what do I like? Why? What don't I like? Why not? And it's important at this point to just be super honest. You're not asking yourself what you should like. You're trying to get at really, what do I respond to? And sometimes it can be very faint and hard uh, if this is something that's been underdeveloped in your life. Now, you don't stop there, though. There is a kind of next stage. And again, it's not saying, all right, um, should I have liked that and kind of being skeptical towards yourself. But it's you, what you're building towards by asking, why do I like this and why do I not like that? What you're building towards is the formulation of an abstract standard of value that 
we talked about how valuing is having a standard and selecting things according to that standard. And what you're trying to build towards is, okay, what is my standard? What do, not just what some authority tell me is the right standard of value, but what do I see as, yeah, these are my standards, the way that, that Rourke in building has his own standard of what is good building and what is the purpose I'm trying to execute on. And then it's, now I'm going to select my values consciously by this standard. And I might discover that some of the things that I went through the process and said, well, I really like this. I might re recognize that, no, they're not actually values. I don't actually, when I see them in the full context and in the context of having a real standard of value, um, certain things get pushed out or demoted, um, but that you, you start with where your values are, you get to a standard that you first-handedly endorse, and then you can kind of refine and integrate your values around that standard. And then the final thing I'll say is that it's valuable to practice small acts of self-assertion. So if you are somebody who's characteristically afraid of getting into conflict with others, you know, it's not that you're just going to jump right in, like sit down at a meal and say, hey, grandma, God doesn't exist. Like that's not the issue, but it's you practice small acts of self-assertion. So, I mean, even something as simple as like, you know, if you're driving some with somebody and they ask you, oh, how's the temperature? No, well, it's too cold or it's too hot. And there's if if you're naturally or characteristically very independent, like that seems very trivial, but for people who are not, even those small acts of independence of asserting, yeah, I, uh, this is what I think. I think it's too cold and I might be inconvenient for you to change it. Like that can be a big achievement and, or I don't want to see that movie or I do want to see that movie or you didn't like that movie. Well, I did like the, the movie. The small acts of independence can be extremely empowering and an incentive to engage in bigger and bigger acts of independence and i mean there's a real way in which you bring yourself into reality by asserting you, what your judgment and your evaluation of things and you feel more real and i think that by starting small there's a book that came out which i haven't read but uh, i follow the person's newsletter atomic habits by james clear and what he really focuses on is what's the smallest thing that one can do that puts one on a trajectory towards the ultimate kind of way of life that one wants to engage in. So if you're thinking about exercise, yeah, eventually I want to get to the point of being able to put in, you know, an hour a day of really intense exercise that's going to uh, make me feel energized and healthy. Um, but I start out by just, all right, what's the smallest thing that I know I'll do every day? All right, I'll do three push ups every day at 11 a.m. or whatever. And and so I think it's the same way when you're cultivating virtues is you think, what are small strides that I can make that bring me those rewards and help me start to build um, a, a new virtue into my character? So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And as always, the best way to stay in contact is to go to donswriting.com and sign up for the newsletter. Talk next time.